Well, thank you all very much for joining us for our press briefing. We, as always, will start off by reminding everybody that we have a pandemic going on and that it's important that we continue to follow our rules with regard to keeping that six foot of distance between you and other people when you're out in public, wearing a mask when you go to the store, washing your hands often. And then, of course, last week we talked about our three C's to avoid, those confined spaces, crowded places, and close contact. So those are the places the virus is likely to spread. So we want people to uh, take uh, care to be able to avoid them if they can. And if you can't, if you have to be in one of those places where you're going to be closer than six feet to somebody else, please wear a mask. That will help slow the spread of the virus as well. And all of that is around, all these uh, rules are designed around trying to preserve our hospital capacity. So by slowing the spread of the virus, we can make sure that we provide that hospital bed, that ICU bed, and that ventilator to anybody who needs it when they need it. Currently in the state of Nebraska, we have 38% of our hospital beds are available, 37% of our ICU beds available, and 78% of our ICU beds are available. So we've got great capacity, we want to be able to keep it that way. Even as we see these increasing hospitalizations, we can help address that by practicing our good rules. And of course, another way that we always want to remind people that you can help fight the spread of virus here in our state is through Test Nebraska. You sign up for testnebraska.com. You can go get tested. Maybe you want, you're going to go see your grandmother. That would be a great reason to go get tested. Make sure you don't have coronavirus before you go see somebody. Uh, and as soon as you sign up, you can start looking for slots to be able to get tested in. We have uh, delivered over 330,000 tests and 1.2 million dollars. Uh, sorry, 1.2 million unique assessments through Test Nebraska. So uh, please uh, continue to remember those ways that we can fight the spread of coronavirus. Now, today, we're very excited. Uh, we've got uh, Seema Verma, who's the administrator for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, to talk to us today about our 1115 waiver for our Heritage Health Adult or Medicaid expansion. So just to remind everybody where we are is that after the voters approved Medicaid expansion here in Nebraska, the Department of Health and Human Services worked on our Heritage Health Adult to be able to provide a two-tiered program for those able-bodied adults who will be signing up for Medicaid expansion. And we were getting ready, we were going, working our way through the process, developing all the systems and so forth, hiring people to be able to administer it so we can provide a really great customer experience. And we were working with CMS to be able to, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, to be able to get our 1115 waiver to put in our two-tiered approach. And then the pandemic hit. And guess what? CMS got really busy working on the national response for fighting the pandemic and had to delay approving our 1115 waiver. Now, we as the state, we went forward with our basic plan, which is the plan that we rolled out August 1st. People would start signing up. Coverage began October 1st. And that's the plan that we went out with. Now, we will be able to be add on that second tiered plan that we have for the plan to really uh, promote the kind of uh, behaviors we want to look for with regard to wellness, personal responsibility, and community engagement. And that's what this is really about. So right now, everybody gets the basic plan with the exceptions of people who are, and uh, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail, but uh, people who are 19 to 20, pregnant, or medically frail, those folks get the complete plan. But everybody else is on kind of on the basic plan. Now with this, based upon those things I talked about around wellness activities like going to a healthcare provider once a year and getting screenings, uh, personal responsibility, actually showing up for your appointments, for example, uh, or uh, as we roll into this later, community engagement, things like uh, working for a charity or a nonprofit group or uh, you know, looking for a job or getting an education, those sort of things, you'll be able to qualify for that second tier, which includes dental, vision, and over-the-counter drugs. So we're very excited to be able to talk about that today. And so with that, I'd like to go ahead and um, uh, before I introduce Seema Verma, I will, uh, our other speakers are gonna be Dan Ed Smith, our CEO from the Department of Health and Human Services, and Nate Watson, who's our Deputy Director for uh, Policy and Regulation. Uh, normally Jeremy Brunson would be here, but he had a family issue and was not able to join us. So with that, uh, uh, Administrator Verma, thank you very much for joining us. It's an honor to have you here. We're really excited. I'm going to turn over the program to you. Thank you so much. It's, it's great to join you all virtually. And first of all, I just want to say thank you for all your leadership and hard work on the pandemic. Uh, Nebraska has been a real leader 
and we appreciate everything that you're doing. And those of you that are on the front lines, um, we know it's been tough, but we just appreciate everything that you're doing. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to deliver the good news about the approval of this very innovative and creative approach to improving the lives of your citizens. You know, for decades, state health systems have been micromanaged, and their ability to innovate has been restricted by Washington bureaucracy. And I've worked on Medicaid at the state level before becoming administrator, and so I, I know how painful the back and forth with CMS can be. But all of that has changed under President Trump, and instead of micromanaging states, we've empowered them, and he's turned the states back into laboratories of democracy and innovation. Empowering states represents a crucial element of the fresh approach the president has brought to bear, one that is delivering better care, lower cost, and more choices to all Americans. In turn, our administration has given states every opportunity to come up with creative ideas to care for their populations, and it's working. Nebraska's plan under our Medicaid waiver is designed to create a voluntary pathway for Nebraska adults with newly gained Medicaid coverage to access additional benefits if they participate in certain activities, as you just outlined. In 2018, we laid out a broad vision for what these sorts of waivers might look like, uh, recognizing that there's no one-size-fits-all for Medicaid programs, just as there's no one-size-fits-all for community engagement waivers. And our guidance included ensuring that beneficiaries had the appropriate protections in place while advancing the work of states to improve health outcomes. And states like Nebraska have taken us up on our invitation to innovate and all come at the issue in unique ways. And just last week, I was in Georgia approving another such waiver, and Nebraska now represents the 13th community engagement waiver in all. But these reforms in particular represent undeniable gains for the people of Nebraska. However, as surely as night follows day, there will be those that are bent on weaponizing the legal system to thwart state innovation. But rest assured, President Trump will defend the rights of states to design their own programs and work to ensure that Americans are in charge of their health, not special interest groups. I applaud Governor Ricketts and the state of Nebraska for taking President Trump, on, Trump up on his invitation to innovate in caring for their state's residents. The state isn't just handing out Medicaid cards, they're trying to improve the health of these individuals by giving them the dignity of a job, a pathway out of poverty, and the financial independence that every American seeks. States like Nebraska don't just have their own unique problems, they also have innovative solutions that deserve to be tested. And to that end, I am very excited to approve this waiver. CMS will be here for every step of the way to support your efforts. And thank you for allowing me to be a part of your event today. And with that, I'm going to, to sign the waiver. All right, great. And, uh, here we go. Here's my end of the bargain. All right. Well, I'm going to uh, do the ceremonial signing on this side of the video conference. And I have done as well. Got my, I don't know, can you, do you have the camera on me? Can you see me? I can see it. That's All right. Great. Good. Good deal. Well, hey, Administrator Verber, thank you so much. I, I know uh, Danette's planning on talking a little bit more about your team, but we could not have got this done without your the great work of your team. We really appreciate it. She's going to give some kudos to some of the specific people that helped us during our press conference here a little bit later. I know that you've got to run off of, you know, you've got a lot of things on your plate, uh, but we really appreciate you taking the time. And again, your team has just been fantastic as we've worked through not only this pandemic, but getting our waiver and all the other things that you've got going on in the place. So thank you so much. We really, really thank appreciate Thank you, it. Governor. All right. Now with that, I'm going to go ahead and bring up Danette Smith, our CEO of Health and Human Services, to expand a little bit more about what Heritage Health Adult will look like and what our 1115 waiver will do for the people of Nebraska. Danette? Thank you, 
Good afternoon to everyone, and I am so excited to be here to talk about our Medicaid expansion uh, program, Heritage Health for Adults. And I'm also excited about being joined today with Nate Watson, who is our uh, Deputy Director over Policy, and I'm so excited for us to be able to announce today. When I took the job as CEO of Nebraska's Department of Health and Human Services, the governor challenged me to ensure that Medicaid expansion would begin and that it would begin on time. My staff have diligently worked from February of 2019 all the way to today to make sure that Medicaid expansion or Heritage Health for Adults is on time and that we are ready to go by April 1st, 2021. But we could not have done that effort without our federal partners. And those federal partners represent our regional offices who have been on the phone with us constantly making sure that our data, that all of our APDs and uh, our standard conditions are all together and that they're ready so that we can appropriately serve uh, Nebraskans in a timely way. And so with being able to say that, I'd like to also be able to acknowledge a couple of people from both our regional office, but also in our office of CMS out in Baltimore. Those folks would be the following people. Number one, Ann Costello, who is currently acting as the deputy director at CMS at the federal level, who has been instrumental in looking at the total process for Medicaid expansion as well as Ed Dolly and Shaquille uh, Khan. Both of these gentlemen have been instrumental in making sure that our IT bill solution that we need to be able to implement Medicaid expansion is ready, it's launched and it's ready to go, and we have absolutely no hiccups in our application process. So I wanted to be able to share that with you today because not only has it been the team, the Medicaid long-term care team here in Nebraska, but it's also been our federal partners both at the regional and national level that has really ensured that we have a timely um, launch of our Medicaid expansion and the demonstration project that will happen on April 2021. As you recall, some of the most critical data that I want to share with you today is where we are with the application process. And certainly, Nate is going to come up and talk a little bit more with you about the 1115 waiver. But I want you to know that there are approximately 14,116 persons who are now eligible for a Heritage Health Adult Program, and we're very excited about that. But we've also, with Medicaid, not just Medicaid expansion, but Medicaid applications in general, we've taken approximately 25,000 applications, with again 14,116 persons being eligible for the expansion. We believe that we are on target to meet that 90,000 persons who we believe will be eligible and who will benefit from our waiver, and we're very excited about it. Finally, we want to make sure that our listeners here today in the press conference are aware that we expect better health outcomes for Nebraskans. We also believe that people will live better lives because they will be in charge of their individual wellness, but they'll also be taking steps to employment and also an overall well-being perspective. And so with that, I'm going to call Nate Watson up, who is our Deputy Director over Policy, to talk specifically about the 1115 waiver. Nate? Good afternoon, and thank you, Governor and CEO Smith. So what is the 1115 demonstration waiver? What it does, as the Governor alluded to, it allows the department to be able to do new innovative features so that individuals not only receive a shiny new card in the mail, but they get the help they need, that great customer service we continue to provide to Nebraskans so that they can fully utilize that benefit so they can get into the doctor, they can get that appointment made. If they need a ride, they can get that ride to the doctor so that they get that health care so that we continue to provide that great customer service to them and so that they continue to exercise that personal responsibility on their own behalf to make sure they get to the, the doctor and keep those appointments. And it allows us to be good stewards of the taxpayer dollars by being efficient with those funds, people getting the care in the best way possible for their own health, as well as allowing us to be efficient with the taxpayer money so that we can serve more Nebraskans in need. So phase one of expansion started on October 1st. 
And so we started taking applications for Medicaid expansion with benefits starting October 1st. And what we're talking about today is phase two. And phase two starts next April, so April of 21. And what that is, is individuals who are not 19 and 20 years old, pregnant, or medically frail, and those are individuals who don't quite meet the severity or duration requirements to, to be declared uh, disabled by Social Security, but still need some extra help. If you're not one of those individuals and you acquire Medicaid through expansion, based on the approval today signed by the governor and administrator Verma, you'll now have the opportunity to qualify for those services of vision services, dental services, and over-the-counter medications. Now, an important point I'd like to make is unlike other states who have a demonstration waiver, in Nebraska, this, this uh, demonstration program has built, been built uniquely by Nebraskans for Nebraska. And what it does, unlike every other state to our knowledge, everyone who participates in it, even if they choose not to engage in these additional activities of personal responsibility and wellness, will continue to receive Medicaid. They will not lose their eligibility if they choose not to engage in these activities. If they choose to engage in these activities, take that personal responsibility to, to make sure that they get to the doctor every year. That when they make an appointment, that they show up, unless they've got a really good reason to not show up to their appointment. And that they keep their, if they've got insurance through their workplace and it's affordable, that they keep that as their primary coverage. It's important if, if individuals engage in these wellness and personal responsibility activities to further their own health, then they will be able to qualify for dental, vision, and over-the-counter medications. We want to incentivize people to participate in their own health. And that's all I have with regard to the uh, additional uh, details with regard to the waiver. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Nate. Maybe I can just uh, recap a little bit here then. So again, the uh, Medicaid waiver that we thought we were gonna be able to get earlier this year and have it ready to go for our August 1st uh, enrollment and our October 1st implementation or coverage was not available because CMS was busy with the pandemic. But today we're announcing that CMS has now approved our 1115 waiver so we can offer our second tier. So everybody, as Nate was saying, everybody will get the basic, pack, basic package. And then starting on April 1st, 2021, we will have the second tier available. Now, if you're 19 to 20, medically frail or pregnant, you're already gonna get the dental, vision, and uh, over-the-counter drugs. But for everybody else who's on that Heritage Health Adults, you'll be able to qualify that by taking responsibility for your wellness. For example, going to get that, uh, you know, going to see your healthcare provider once a year and getting that screening taking personal responsibility, as Nate says, going to your, your uh, appointments, don't skip them unnecessarily, or uh, also uh, maintaining your uh, employer su uh, supplied healthcare insurance, that's another way to take personal responsibility. And then starting in 2022, we will have the community engagement aspect, which will include things such as working for the nonprofit, um, going to school, looking for a job 80 hours a month, uh, you know, employment type activities 80 hours a month, those will the things that will roll out in 2022. So we're very excited to have the administrator sign our waiver and to get this program rolling that w the way it was originally intended. Uh, and while uh, we are going to not be able to begin this until April 1st, better late than ever. So we're very excited to be able to be here. With that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, open up to questions. Justin, do we have any that were sent in ahead of time? Or Taylor, were any sent in? No, 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 no questions were sent in ahead of time. So we're going to just go with folks in the audience. And Danette and Nate, don't go too far because uh, you're probably going to be the ones answering these questions, not me. <laughs> Martha. So, um, how does this compare to what the state applied for originally? Um, you're talking, I, I caught one difference in that you're talking the community engagement portion is going to be delayed. Um, and then also, can you explain in April of 2021, is that when people can start to qualify for this second tier, in which case they don't, would not receive the benefits until sometime in the future, or how does that work? 
Right, so the question uh, from Martha was, uh, how is this different? And again, it's obviously being delayed. We had hoped to roll this all out October 1st with you know, the enrollment period beginning August 1st and with the um, coverage beginning October 1st being delayed till April 1st. And then the question is, okay, so are people going to qualify ahead of time and then begin to get the dental vision over the counter drugs April 1st or they qualify April 1st for a later date of implementation? And I'm gonna ask Nate to come up and talk about that, yes. Nate, if you can come up and talk a little bit more about the details about how that all worked. Sure. And don't get, you might, you might just get comfortable there because you're going to take more questions. All right. Uh, individuals will have the opportunity to uh, qualify uh, starting in next April. And so when, the, when would they be able to start getting like, the dental and vision coverage? It, uh, it would be as soon as they meet the uh, requirements. So it would be effective as of the next benefit tier if they meet the qualifications in that tier. So, so help, help me out then. Yeah. Say, I, say, I get, say I, April 1st, I apply for the dental vision and everything else. Mm -hmm. I've gone to see my healthcare provider. When do I get to go see the eye doctor? You, uh, you would be able to qualify as of that October date. October the following, so yes, sir. qualify April 1st? Yes. No, October 1st of 2021 is when I would start getting it. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Then it was originally going to be? S simultaneous with October. Originally, if we had been able to receive the approval, there would have still been like a six month qualification period. Indeed, indeed. So it would have been April? Yes. And so then why is the community engagement portion separate? We wanted to roll out different components of uh, the demonstration at different times. It was always envisioned that community engagement would, enro would roll out one year after the start date of the demonstration. So that particular piece has not changed the timing vis-a-vis -vis the other pieces. So in April of 2021, you have to meet the wellness and personal responsibility requirements. Mm -hmm. And then in 2022, you have to meet additional requirements for the same benefits. Yes, additional, uh, there will be additional activities that a person would be expected to choose to engage in if they would like to have those benefit shares. But again, you don't have to qualify for all of them. It's just selected ones that if you, quali if you do, you qualify. Is that accurate? Yes. So the wellness requirement is uh, getting a primary care physician? Yes. So there, there, are three, there are three items to the wellness. There's first uh, picking a primary care provider. And frankly, on that one, if, if an individual does not choose a primary care provider, one will be uh, assigned to them. So that requirement will be met one way or the other. The two other requirements are making sure you get in to see your doctor or other healthcare professional at least once a year, as we all should. And then the third requirement is working with your health plan to complete that health risk screening. And that health risk screening is so important because it helps the health plan help you. It meets you where you're at. It, it establishes a baseline of what is your current health? What are the things that, you know, what are the things that maybe each of us need to improve on in our health? And so, and maybe, yes, sir. And also maybe we could talk about, because that's part of our goals to get better health outcomes, right? Yes, sir. So maybe we could talk about that a little bit too. Yes. What this does is we want to incentivize people to, to get in and use that benefit in the most appropriate way. And what do we mean by that? There, these might be individuals who, in their circumstances, maybe haven't been able to see the doctor in a while. So we want individuals, we want to meet them where they're at. We want them to establish what are their current health conditions, known and unknown to them, so that they can know what they're facing and what they need to work on, so that then they can go get that care because the earlier a person gets that care in an ongoing way, particularly for chronic conditions such as diabetes, for example, if you get that ongoing care, it'll, it'll be most importantly better health outcomes for you because you won't wait until it gets really bad and, and, and show up at the emergency room. But secondarily, it allows us to be more efficient because getting that care earlier is often more, a more prudent use of taxpayer money so that we can be good stewards of the taxpayer money and conserve that money to be able to serve all the individuals in need. I want to see if I understand the three conditions for the first qualification. Yes, sir. Uh, you pick or are assigned a health care, primary health care provider. Yes. You see that person. Yes. And you have to do that before you qualify. Uh, if you want to get those services, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. And with that person, you have to fill out this health screen. 
Well, that health risk screening, thank you for that, uh, allowing me to clarify. The health risk screening will be filled out between you and your health care plan. Uh, like most individuals that we serve in Medicaid today, and like most states, the vast majority, over 38 of them currently, you work with a, a managed care plan, which is a private company that works with you, a private insurance company that works with you and helps manage your care. And in Nebraska, we, we are a leader in this. We have, an, we have an integrated model where your health plan works not only with your so-called physical care, which would be, for example, your general practitioner, your primary care provider, but as well as any behavioral health provider you might have, so your mental health needs, as well as any pharmacy needs you might have. That plan works with you so that all that you're taken care of as a person, as a complete package of services, and they work with you to figure out your current health condition, where you're at, because there might be, again, if you haven't been to the doctor in a while, you might need some assistance finding a doctor, maybe even getting a ride there, and the health plan does that. They help you with that if you choose to accept the help. And then they also figure out what you currently need to work on. What doctors do you need to see? So that you just don't get the card in the mail and then say, have at it, good luck. In Nebraska, we've chosen a very different approach under the governor's leadership and the CEO's leadership. We want to help people meet them where they're at and help them use that card so that they get in there and know how to find a doctor, know how to get to a doctor, literally get a ride there if they need it so that they can actually fully use the benefit. And if they take that personal responsibility to show up at their appointments and to see their doctor every year, as we all should, then they get these additional services. So it's an incentive to help people do the right thing for themselves and their families. So again, to qualify though, you get your doctor signed, you go see your doctor, and then you fill out the healthcare screening with your, uh, your insurance company. Yes, sir. So those three things and you get the coverage. So, so, so those, that's the wellness portion can you talk about the personal responsibility pieces? Yes. So that was the piece the governor spoke to earlier is uh, the primary piece. That is if you, you currently receive insurance through your workplace, and many, though certainly not all, Nebraskans receive, their in, receive insurance through their work, and it meets the standards for affordability under federal law, you should continue to keep that as your primary coverage. And then Medicaid would come in as a secondary insurer to cover anything that your primary insurance would not cover. And the reason for that is if you choose to, uh, if you choose to uh, get those additional services of dental vision over the counter medications. And the reason for that is we want to encourage people to primarily use that private market of insurance rather than completely using a government program. We want, we, we believe in the private market and we don't want people to leave it when it's affordable to stay there in part. There's also a piece about attending your appointments. Yes, sir. Can you it, describe that a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so every six months, what it is, if you want the dental vision and over-the-counter medications, you cannot miss three or more appointments without a good reason in a six-month benefit period. So what, is, what would be some good reasons? And we spent a lot of time going through details and working this out because we, we've done it right and we wanted to do it right. And that's what we were tasked to do and we've done it. And so what we, we thought about, the best example I can give you is if earlier when I said the healthcare plan would arrange a ride for you if you needed one to get to the doctor, let's say that they do arrange it. And let's say through no fault of your own, the ride doesn't show up for whatever reason. Let's say there's a snowstorm or something or you know, whatever reason might be. So that's certainly no fault of the participant that they weren't able to get to the doctor because the ride was arranged for them and it didn't show up. That's not gonna count. That's not gonna count against them. If, if a family has a genuine health emergency, somebody gets in an accident, or God forbid, somebody gets sick, right? And they're not physically not able to go to the doctor. That's a good cause reason. What we're really talking about are if an individual just plain chooses not to go. We, we want to incentivize people not to do that. We want people, if, if they've made the, the appointment with their doctor's office or other healthcare provider, it's not really fair to the doctor or the healthcare provider if there's a no-show for no good reason. You know, it's, it's, it's just not a good experience and we worry about the experience of our providers in Nebraska just as much as our beneficiaries. So we want to encourage people to keep those appointments. And so those, those, are, the two, those are the two primary personal responsibility. There's, there's a third one and what that is is, and it's a requirement that applies to everyone in Medicaid anyway, frankly. And what that is, is if there's a material change in your life circumstances, 
So what would that mean? Well, for example, let's say you got a new job that pays more, or you got a good promotion that pays more, or there was a birth of a new child in the family. If you have a material change in your life circumstances, you have an obligation to let us know timely. And generally that means in the law in about 10 days. Though we do give people some leeway there based on circumstances. And, and why is that important? Well, if an individual would no longer be eligible or no longer qualify for the dental vision and over-the-counter medications coverage, we have an obligation, both in state law and federal law, to not provide benefits to individuals who no longer qualify for them because there's a significant financial penalty to the federal government if, because expansion is currently covered at 90% federal tax money. If we provide a service and it's determined by, by the federal government that we shouldn't have, we're not only out the 10% that the state tax payer money has paid, but we have to reimburse the federal government nine times that for the federal portion of the funds. So it's an obligation. We're asking folks to work with us to make certain that we provide benefits to everyone who meets the qualifications to receive them. But if they don't meet them, we're asking them to, make, to work with us to let us know that so that they are put into the appropriate position and, and that we are efficient and, and meet our obligations to the taxpayer. And can you go on then and describe the community engagement portion and when in 2022 does that start? Sure, if I could, Governor. The, uh, That's why I called you up here, Nate. Thank you, uh, sir. Go to, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and also, what the foundation is. So we get through the first year. Yes. People have met the criteria under the wellness and personal responsibility. Now you're moving into the second year. Talk about how the first year requirements and uh -huh. the second year requirements all play together. Sure. So starting uh, a year later, just as originally envisioned, a year after the launch of, of the demonstration waiver, to earn that, uh, to qualify the, for vision, dental, and over-the-counter medications, individuals will be expected to engage in community engagement. Okay, excuse me, a year later from April or from October? April. It was originally a year later from October if we had been able to go live with the demonstration at the same time as expansion. And, and of course, we weren't able to do that due to, to, to COVID, delaying federal approval. So a year, so in April of 22, individuals who would like to qualify for dental vision over the counter, med, counter medications going forward will have to show that every month they're participating in community activities of at least 80 hours a month. So part-time. And what, what are these sorts of things? These are the sorts of things, it could be a job. It could be, there could be individuals who, at their place in their life, they maybe need some more skills. So it could be going back to school, it could be community college, it could be an apprenticeship. It could be volunteering for a local charity. Getting those skills and connections that are so vital. And again, it's always important to, to, to think back to the fact of the group for whom we are serving. We're talking about folks who are 19 to 64 year old, four years old, who are generally able-bodied. And our goal in this demonstration is to help them with their better help, health, but as the governor said also, to help them, empower them to improve their life situation as well. And we believe that being engaged in one's community, if you're of working age and generally able-bodied, will help your overall health and help the future of your family. So by engaging in those various activities, and it can be any combination of various activities. It doesn't necessarily need to be work. It doesn't necessarily need to be volunteering. You could do a mixture of all those various things. And also uh, participating, we had had a question uh, recently, uh, relatively recently, about participating in inpatient substance use. That would also count. So these are the sorts of things where you're getting beyond the four walls of your home, getting out into the world, again, able-bodied adults of working age to improve their, their health and their overall life for themselves and their families. So, and so Nate, you're supposed to also at the same time still go to visit your doctor once a year. Yes, sir. Um, you know, all, uh, all the other things with regard to not missing appointments and things like that, that's all what you're continuing to do. And then, then the next step is doing these 80 hours a week of one of these community engagements. Yes, sir. 80 hours a month, right? Eight hours a week, month. I'm sorry, eight hours a month, right, thank you. Eight hours a week would be a lot. That'd be a busy week. <laughs> uh, so how, how, is it every six months that you check on these? If you, you know, yes. Okay. And yes. 
how do you verify whether or not some of these community engagement things are actually going on? Thank you. That's a really good question. So, the question to name, please. Sure. Oh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, what are the time periods by which we judge uh, whether someone has met the the activities or not? And uh, I'm sorry, what was the other part of your question, sir? How do you verify it? How do you verify it? Thank you. Um, so there are six-month benefit tier period reviews. And how do we verify it? Through a variety of sources. So for example, if, um, if an individual, when they sign up for and receive Medicaid, they agree as part of their application that we can have access to very various computer systems that we call interfaces. So we have some at the state level. We also have some where we work with various parts of the federal government. That could be the Department of Labor, it could be the IRS, it could be Health and Human Services, it can be a variety of things. And so a lot of times we, we will generally have the information about a person's life. You know, are they employed? Where are they working? We may, we may very well have that information. If we have it, we're certainly not going to ask people to provide the information again. But there will be times where we, where we won't have the information, or there might be just a particular question. We're just not quite sure about a particular uh, thing that we've, we've seen in the record. So we'll reach out to the person. And often we do that by mail, though we also call them. Uh, and then we ask them for that additional information. But first, we try to see if we already know that information, because we don't want to ask people if, we, if they've already provided it or we otherwise have access to it. And we do that every six months. And I guess if you're like a scout leader, you know, who's, who's, you know, you know, you're volunteering your time doing all this, how do you chart how long you, you worked as a scout leader? Because some of it's preparation, some of it's actually with kids, all that kind of stuff. Sure. So we have, uh, so that would be an example of volunteering. Repeat the question. Oh, thank you. Sorry, Governor. Uh, how, do you, how do you verify it? I believe the example you gave, sir, is um, let's say you're, you're volunteering with a scout troop. Uh, how do you verify it? And so what we were utilizing the existing network of public charities. What do I mean by that? We're not going to reinvent the wheel. We're going, to, so if you're working with a recognized public charity, so an entity that has what in tax uh, lingo is known as 501c3 status, they're a charity, a public charity, tax exempt. If, you, if you're volunteering for one of those organizations that have sought and received that IRS classification, or you're working for a group that the IRS deems to be a public charity. That is, they don't actually have to apply for it. They automatically get it. And the best examples of those are state or local governments, like if you're volunteering for a county or a city, uh, or also for any sort of religious organization. For example, Lutheran Family Services or Catholic Charities, just for examples. If you're volunteering for an organization like that, we wanted to work with existing, well-respected, known entities that have either received that formal IRS seal of approval or are deemed to have received it. So uh, that allows us to work on that rather than creating a whole new classification as to what would qualify. So Nate, I think the question was more though. Yes. I'm a person, I say I'm working for the Boy Scouts as a scout. Uh, how, do I ver how do you verify I am? I'm volunteering there. Yes. How do you verify how many hours? Thank you, sir. Uh, that would be, so the, the Boy Scouts would be a good example. So you would have to have a representative of the Boy Scouts write a short note. It, it doesn't need to be anything elaborate, just letting us know what, what you have done and for how many hours, and we will accept it. And so who then will be Thank you. Uh, we have, one of the things we've done to take the time to get expansion right was hiring the best, and we have them. We continue to have such great people working, teammates in the department, and spending the time necessary to train them. So all of these individuals have been hired. We continue to hire and continue to look for individuals, if anyone's interested, by the way. Uh, please apply. We're always looking for Nebraskans to work with us. If uh, those individuals have been trained to help, so right on the front line, right on the phone, in our call centers, our service coordinators, in our local offices, these individuals have been trained to assist and to provide that, uh, that review. And so these folks will be, the, so, we, so to Martha's question, we've hired people to do the verification. Yes, yes sir. Are they separate from your ordinary, um, you know, Everybody who's on Medicaid has to go through a checkup to make sure they're still eligible every so often. Is uh, it different from those people? No. 
it, it'll be the same. We, we cross train so that depending on the work needs that individuals are be able to step in. If a particular area of business uh, is suddenly experiencing a spike in uh, requests or questions or applications, other people can step into the breach and fill it right away so we can continue to keep our good customer service call times and continue to provide that great customer service. And, and Nate, we have to verify current Medicaid enrollees, correct? Yes, sir. So this is really not anything different from what we're already doing with regard to our current population. That is true, yes. Governor, just on a policy, you know, um, I guess, uh, philosophy, philosophy, I guess, you know, um, why doesn't this create more hoops for people that are already busy, you know, and may not have time to do all these paperwork and all these other things? And how do you balance that between having an effective, you know, program that's supposed to talk about these working people? Yeah, so what we're doing with this program is that everybody gets the basic coverage. And for the premium coverage that includes dental, vision, and the over the medicine, what we're doing is really trying to incent folks to do the right thing for their own wellness. So going to the doctor once a year, filling out the health screening, miss making those appointments when you make them. Don't skip your appointments that you've made. All these things around, whether it's wellness, personal responsibility, and then in the second year, the community engagement, are designed to get better outcomes for the people we're serving. So it's, of course, it's basic coverage is gonna to apply to everybody. So if you don't want to do these things, you don't have to. You're going to get the basic coverage no matter what. Uh, subject to, you got to be qualified, right? Just, just like our regular Medicaid program. But to receive the additional services with regard to dental, vision, and over counter medicine, what we're doing is really trying to create a program that, that encourages people to get better health outcomes. How much more does it cost you to, to go through this verification program as opposed to just letting everybody have the, you know, the, the upgraded services? So the question was, how much uh, more does this going to cost for the verification program rather than just letting everybody have the additional services? And I think that, first of all, again, the verification program is not something new for us. We have to do that anyway for everybody who's on Medicaid. So this is just a, an additional, you know, a marginal work on top of it. I don't know how much we've estimated on top, uh, off the top on how much that would cost. We can probably work to get that for you, Andrew, because I don't know off the top of my head what we would envision that be. but. Uh, obviously what we've determined is the cost benefit trade-off there that the people will get more benefit out of the wellness aspect will offset the cost for us doing the additional verification. Martha. You're describing these as premium services when actually these are services that are part of Medicaid. So everyone else on Medicaid gets these services and what you're describing as basic is, is a stripped down version of normal Medicaid. The initiative that was passed said that people were, were that the Medicaid expansion was to provide people Medicaid coverage uh, at the same level as uh, existing Medicaid. So how do you square these two? Okay, so Martha, I'm not, I'm not following your question. How do you square the idea that you are providing people with fewer services in the basic tier and the initiative which said that people were, that the expansion was to provide people with the same coverage as, okay, so I, as I, other Medicaid? So I, I believe we are. So obviously we have certain populations that do qualify for the dental vision and over-the-counter medicines, and Nate, I may have to jump in here if I, get, if I go astray. But that's a relatively small part. It's the pregnant women, it's the people who are minors, it's the people who are uh, medically frail. So that, that population is gonna continue to, to we'll get the additional benefits. So it's this, there's just the broad Medicaid group, and Nate, do you wanna come up and yes, sir. kind of talk a little bit more about the difference between the current Medicaid population and the expansion? Mm -hmm. If you take a look at the, the precise language of the, the ballot initiative, all individuals similarly situated are treated similarly. And again, we're talking about able-bodied adults, 19 to 64 years old. All of them are treated similarly. They're all similarly situated. It's consistent with that legal obligation. And furthermore, the act of qualifying for those benefits of dental vision over-the-counter medications are the simple things of seeing your doctor every year, 
not missing appointments for no good reason. The sorts of things that all of us as individuals should reasonably be expected to engage in as a part of our own wellness for ourselves and our families and personal responsibility. It is not a difficult qualification. Those sorts of things that allow, that incentivize even individuals to participate in achieving their better health. question Martha's asking is are we concerned that there's going to be a legal challenge because in other states there have been legal challenges to some of these types of programs and some of those states have um, had to reverse the direction they were going and as Administrator Verma was talking about we believe we've designed a program that will uh, withstand any legal challenges that people have. Can I, well, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just going to ask on what basis you uh, what basis do I believe that we have a, a program that will sustain the legal challenge? Probably need to get an attorney up here to get into more of the details. But again, the way we've designed it is that everybody gets the basic program, so nobody is going to be refused to get anything. And we've given a variety of ways to incent people to, again, really focus around health and wellness to be able to get the premium package of the dental vision and um, over-the-counter drugs. So I think we're different from some of the other state plans, and I think Administrator Verma referenced that in her remarks. Andrew. Can I ask a, a question on a different subject? Well, let's wait. Are we done with this subject? You guys, let's exhaust this one first before we get up, move on to a separate topic. Martha, anything else? Fred? Okay, Andrew, you can ask away. Well, our owner friend and the chopping at the bill, try to chop us a bit to apply for your expanded uh, relief. He says the website is down right now. So, uh, Andrew said there's a Bartender chopping at the bit to apply, and I'd remind him that the website will not be available till 10 a.m. on Wednesday, October 21st. So he just needs to wait a little more, less than a day. <laughs> the website will be open. So that's not, it's not down, it's just not open yet. It's just, it's not down, it's just not open yet. We'll, it, we'll begin taking applications at 10 a.m. tomorrow, October 21st. And the other question that I have was the White House Task Force, uh, not the Coronavirus Task Force, Force has put Nebraska in the red, or you know, um, in many areas of Nebraska in the red, and says that you know the, the, the leadership here should, I guess, do more to mitigate the spread. Um, I guess, are you familiar with that task force report? And number two, what more will, are you considering to try to mitigate the spread? So the question was, the White House task force has put Nebraska in a red zone. Uh, because of the additional cases that we had per 100,000. And am I aware of that? The answer is yes. And uh, can I just remind people that we took the additional steps with regard to the directed health measures that we tightened down last week, the additional money we're providing to hospitals to, to be able to augment their staffing. And uh, then of course launched our three C's campaign to communicate to folks around avoiding confined spaces, crowded spaces, and close contact. So we are taking additional steps. And then Andrew's follow-on question was, what additional things are we considering? And again, as we said, going back to the beginning of the spring, once you start implementing directed health measures, you really need to wait a couple of weeks to see uh, how they're having an impact. And so we will consider additional steps, but we want to get these, um, this DHM implemented starting tomorrow is when the DHM starts. And then we'll let it run for a couple of weeks and we'll continue to review it in the meantime. So you're saying that that, that recommendation to do more things to mitigate was before you, uh, you had already put in those added directed health measures. So I'm sorry, Andrew, what was so it? So the recommendation to do more to mitigate was done, uh, uh, was, was made before you had actually put in these new directed health measures. So the question was, did the White House recommendations come before we put the DHM in on, uh, well, this will go effective tomorrow? And the answer is yes, but they've been also saying that for, since the beginning of they started publishing these reports. Um, you know, the, the, again, the White House is making recommendations, but each of the states is really, you know, uh, responsible for implementing the decisions that are going to be work best for it, and that's what we're doing here in Nebraska. Is we're putting together programs tailored to Nebraska. 
Governor, it seems like uh, hospital capacity, according to the dashboard, has uh, increased considerably. I think it was in the low 20s and now it's in the high 30s. Is there some uh, specific reason for that that you're aware of? So the question was with regard to hospital capacity, it was down in the 20s, now it's up in the 30s. And I think part of it's just the variability. If you noticed how many hospital beds are available on a given day, if they're staffed hospital beds. So if a hospital doesn't have staffing, that number will come down. If a hospital, hospital does have staffing, that number goes up. So it's just the number of beds, so the denominator, so to speak, will change day to day, as well as the numerator, which is the number of people that are in the hospital. And they're not all directly related to coronavirus patients either, right? So some of it is going to be just people coming in for elective surgery, some of it's gonna be other emergency type operations. So that number will fluctuate. And then the other thing I would just throw in there as a, an added piece of variability is we're relying on the hospitals to report to us on a daily basis. And so we need to continue to solicit their help and making sure they get those reports in daily and not every hospital does report daily. And so that can also have an impact on what that daily number looks like. And Governor, I don't know if you have heard, but the number of uh, mayors in Big Ten uh, cities have asked the Big Ten, the league, not to schedule games late in the afternoon uh, so that you don't have a lot of people having parties inside their homes, you know, uh, as much as they, they can. I guess they try to reduce the spread of the, the virus. I mean, what do you think about that? Should, you know, would you, what do you think about all daytime games, I guess? So the question was, uh, apparently some of the mayors in other cities have asked the Big Ten not to schedule games in the afternoon. They prefer to have it in the morning so that you don't have parties in the afternoon to kind of avoid spreading it. I had not seen that story, uh, but you know I'm a Chicago Cubs fan, so I'm a big fan of daytime baseball. So, and, I, and frankly, I personally like day game football too. So, you know, I th frankly, I think those decisions, um, you know, obviously rest with the Big Ten. Um, I think that we can manage it whatever the Big Ten wants to do. That, frankly, with regard to the stadium, they're not allowing any fans in there right now. And you're not going to be able to regulate what somebody does inside their own home, which is why we need to educate people about all of our tools that we use. Again, we, we launched the 3C campaign in our DHM. We're, you know, for example, having bar owners. Your friend's going to have to make sure all their patrons have a seat. There's not going to be standing room only in bars and so forth. So uh, we do want to take appropriate precautions, but I think really part of it is just educating people about making sure they're taking steps within their own home to be able to slow the spread of the virus and preserve our hospital capacity. I know we're going to get a chance to talk to you before the, the game this, <laughs> this Saturday, but what would your recommendation be for people that want to have parties and, and, you know, and invite people to watch the game? Yeah, my recommendation if you're looking to have a party is keep the party small. Try and, uh, I don't know what the weather's going to be like on Saturday. It's probably going to be a nice, cool fall day. If you can move your TV outside and have the party outside and try and keep people space, space six feet away from each other, that's going to be the best. If you're going to be inside, uh, again, try to keep people six feet apart. If you're going to be closer than six feet, wear a mask. You know, these are the kind of things that I would ask people to do as they think about this. We want to make sure, folks, that we kind of walk before we run here, okay? So let's work to be able to have a successful football season. Let's take it a step at a time and slowly. Let's make sure we continue to take steps to slow the spread of the virus in here because at the end of the day, we want to make sure we can provide that hospital bed, that ICU bed, or that ventilator to anybody who needs it. All right, no last questions? Thank you all very much. Appreciate you being here. We will, our next press conference will be on Thursday at 1 p.m. in Spencer, opening up a bridge, the last bridge that was uh, closed due to the flooding. And again, just want to remind people, we still have our virus in the community. Wear your mask and go to the store. Stay at six feet away. Wash your hands often and avoid the three C's of crowded spaces, close contact, and confined spaces. That will help us slow the spread of the virus. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Francis. Thank you, Governor.